What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to a brand new episode of VR365. Yeah, we are here 365 days a year. VR365, it's so incredible. I'm here every day. I mean, what other YouTuber streams every single day with the latest news, the latest stories, keeping you so up to date? It is incredible. In fact, it's just incredible VR. Okay, so the truth is, not really VR365. A lot less than that. In fact, honestly, haven't had a lot of shows lately. And that's why I'm back on this final evening of 2020, the greatest year ever. And I figured, look, this is the greatest year ever. 2020 is incredible. It's going to go down in the history books as one to be remembered. And I figured I've got to do at least one more episode this year. Also, I do want to say to any of my Patreon supporters, the few, the proud, the Marines, my Patreon supporters out there, not a lot of you guys left, but the ones that are left, I do want to say that I absolutely appreciate your support, no joke, and I do feel bad about this month not having a lot of content on this channel. And, you know, my apologies. I should have probably turned off the Patreon for the month of December, uh, forgot about it, didn't do it. But here's the good news. The good news is I did turn it off for January. Okay, so a free month is coming up on January. No payment required. But yeah, thanks so much to the Patreon supporters out there. Um, you know, things are going on in the background. And so not a lot of time to do a ton of different videos and stuff. But I still will try to show up on here on occasion. Also... I am going to be on the next episode of MRTV's uh, Next Dimension podcast coming up this Saturday. I believe we're going to kind of look back at the year 2020, the year that was, and talk all about it. So that will be on MRTV's channel. I believe it is noon on Saturday, noon Pacific time on Saturday. So be sure to check that out. Okay, so what did I want to get into today? Well, I've only got a couple of different topics to talk about, but I still have some stuff to get into and discuss. And, you know, let's see, the first thing I want to get in here, uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to switch over here. Apologies for that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a game into this ginormous trailer window. And I want to talk about a game that I've been playing recently because I don't know if people realize just how freaking incredible this game is. And I feel like it's getting better and better every single time I play it. The last time I play it, the last time I played it was incredible. I, it was breathtaking. I was blown away. I could not believe what was going on both visually and audio, especially the audio. The 3D audio, incredible. Possibly the best 3D audio on the Oculus Quest, bar none. I'm talking about Racket and X. And Racket and X in all truth, this is one of the best Quest games, period. Like, no joke. Like, this is easily one of the very best Quest games. Right now on VRGameRankings.com, we have, um, we're, we're working on re-ranking all of the various Quest games. We're going to have a, like 150 different Quest games ranked. We've updated some of those charts. We got some more to update. But I can tell you that Racket and X is now ranked higher than it's ever been. It's ranked, I believe it's 17. I think it's number 17 overall. And the truth of the matter is, it should be like five spots higher. It should really be five, five spots higher. It should be flirting with the top 10 on the Oculus Quest. 
That is how good this game is. This game, you know when I, I, I talk about Tron likes, right? I've created this phrase, it is called Tron like. And so if you're playing a video game and you feel like this kind of reminds me of Tron, well, that's a Tron like. Trademark, I get a quarter every time you do that. Um, but yeah, Racket and X is a Tron like. When I'm in this game, in my Oculus Quest 2 or Oculus Quest 1, either one, and I've been bouncing back and forth between those two headsets, and I've got, I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit later. It's kind of interesting bouncing back and forth between the two. But this game, man, I feel like I'm in some kind of Tron-like game. Like I'm there, I'm in the world. It's very 360. You can remember back to when we were thinking about just the idea of the Oculus Quest and the idea of standalone and the idea of completely wireless. And before we even got the Oculus Quest, some of us were thinking about, you know, what games are really going to take advantage of wireless? And the most obvious answers are games that are ridiculous 360 degree by nature. So any game where it's like really 360, uh, a game that comes to mind is like Brookhaven Experiment or Propagation VR, which is a free game that is on Steam. Both of those games are like wave shooters where you're kind of just standing in one spot and you've got like uh, zombies and stuff that are coming at you from all different angles. And so you're always turning around 360 because anything can come behind you at any time. So it's very 360. Those are the kind of games I think about. But another one is Racket and X because this game just is 360. It's hard to play this game on a wired headset without being extremely conscious of how many times you turn that way, how many times you turn this way. I don't want to do that, man. And so on the Oculus Quest, you don't have to do that. And Racket and X, audio, visual, splendor. And not only that, but here's the most amazing thing. Okay, I'm hold on. I'm going to try to find. I know I have a, yeah, I have a new, this is a Racket and X mixed reality trailer. So uh, there's a cooler trailer and, and using the Quest and these visuals that you're seeing, it's exactly what it looks like. This is exactly what it looks like. And people that are in this game, that are playing this game um, in their headsets, they know that, yeah, okay, the graphics are not unbelievably incredible, but what they've done visually with the art style, it is so dialed in. It is so nailed. Like, they're not trying to, like, go beyond what the quest is capable of like like they're doing exactly what the quest is capable of and what they've created is they've created this 360 arena that just wraps around you and you're interacting with that arena and you're interacting with that arena and you got a timer that's ticking down and you're trying to get these like ricochet shots and it's about to run out and you're running out of time and so you're scrambling so the last time i played this I accidentally got into some other mode that I, I don't even know what mode I was in, but I accidentally like was fumbling through the menus and I accidentally selected some like extra bonus mode thing, a mode that I never tried. And like the whole audio visual experience with the announcer and moving all the way through, like getting through these different uh, levels and moving on. It was phenomenal, man. And this game has improved. I remember when I went to New York, if you guys remember when I went to New York, it was the su it was last summer. It was the last good summer to ever go to New York. I luckily made it to New York. Seriously, the last good summer of New York, probably until like 2035 or something. It's going to be a long time before New York is chill again. And when I was in New York, this was like, I don't, I, I think I might've had a preview copy on the Quest. Luckily, I was like a rare bird, had a preview copy of Racket and X on the Quest. I don't think it came out yet, or maybe it was just, maybe it had just come out or something. But I remember playing this in my hotel room in New York while I'm, you know, waiting before we're going to go out somewhere or whatever. And I was really impressed by it. I loved it. I thought it was incredible. But playing it recently, holy smokes, holy smokes, 
They've dramatically improved this thing. It's like they're constantly banging at this baby and they're constantly. And also the other thing about this game is like, if I'm going to let somebody try my Oculus Quest, I'm putting them in this. Why wouldn't I put them in this? This is 360 as F. You're just swinging a freaking racket. You're hitting a ball. When the ball goes into that thing and then it goes zzz, and it goes slow mo, that's when you're like, zzz, you know, like freaking six million dollar man style. And you smash it and you just feel so good. Um, really love it. So yeah, Racket NX on the Oculus Quest. Can't recommend it enough. Not exactly cheap. I think this thing is going for like 29 bangers, $29.99, so not exactly cheap. Don't know if it's been on sale recently, but damn, these fools have really done some special stuff. So that is Racket NX for the Oculus Quest. It's not new. This is nothing new. I'm not talking about a brand new game here. Um, it's been around for a minute, but yeah, wow, incredible. All right, so let's see, what did I wanna get into in terms of other topics? Well, you know what? One thing that I do wanna talk about, of course, is something that is going on in my world from a standpoint of daily driver. Daily driver, folks, I do not currently have a daily driver. There is no valve index in the building. The valve index has left the building. The Eagle has not landed. The Eagle has flown away. It has flown the coop. If you look behind me down there on the ground, you see that Vive box? There used to be a valve index box on top of that. And it's gone. I sold my valve index. I let it fly. I let it go away. And so I'm sure the question is, Anthony, bro, why would you sell your valve index? That was your daily driver, bro. I know you had complaints about it. I know you had issues about it. You've talked incessantly about the glare and how awful the glare is. You've talked about how you don't really like the controllers, how you feel the plastic of the controllers feels unbelievably cheap and you know, you've had you have these little nitpicks, but at the same time you still feel like Overall, the reality is the Valve Index is the best mass market consumer VR headset on the market, but you no longer own the thing. Like, what are you doing, man? What did you do? Why did you do this? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Most of you guys know I had a broken index, not broken, but I had a, um, a less than optimal valve index controller my left valve index controller the thumbstick had drift it had a major case of the drifters you know drifter entertainment was involved in a major way yeah so the left thumbstick would just drift off in a certain direction and the thing is if i could have repaired that if i could have sent that controller away and gotten it repaired maybe it would have cost me like 118 dollars i gotta ship it away to bellevue washington you know some some dude making minimum wage repairs the shit, sends it back to me it's all gracious right well no we we all know the story of that and if you don't know the story of that i've got another video that you can watch about don't buy the valve don't buy that puppy in the window that's the way i like to call it do not buy that puppy in the window so i couldn't do that i couldn't get the controller repaired i couldn't buy an individual controller now what i could have did what i could have done was i could have bought the package of two controllers and then I could have sold my existing controllers and, you know, maybe I sell my existing controllers for like 175 bucks. I buy this new package. So, you know, I could do all of these gymnastics and essentially have a new controller. But I was like, the thing is, what I heard was that valve indexes were going for good money on eBay, that it's very hard to get your hands on a valve index, that if you want a valve index for Christmas, you pretty, you know, you're kind of screwed. You're not going to get it that quickly. 
And so I thought, well, if there's ever a time to sell a valve index, maybe now's the time. Now, I'm not a scalper. I am not a scalper, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, I can prove that I'm not a scalper. Do you know that I had a Quest 2? I had an extra Quest 2 that I sold very recently, and I sold it for $325, which is exactly what I paid for it. Brand spanking new. I sold it to these young ladies um, they were coming from some other city, drove up to Sacramento, bought it. They couldn't find a Quest 2 anywhere. I was like, yeah, it's all gravy. 325 bucks, no scalping whatsoever. Now for the Valve Index, I mean, I sold it for $850. That's how much I sold it. And it does have this like damage controller but and so some people might might think well anthony you're kind of screwing people over no i mean i totally advertised it the guy actually came over here so that's the other thing this is a rare thing i will sell things in person sometimes and i'll go meet somebody somewhere and i know a lot of people don't like doing this like i'll use craigslist i mean maybe one day i'm going to end up you know, being a uh, victim of an axe murderer because I sold something on Craigslist to the wrong axe murderer person. That could possibly happen. But I will oftentimes sell things that are like big and heavy like this. I'll try to sell it locally for a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't have to ship it and go through all the gymnastics of trying to pack it up properly. If you sell something on eBay, somebody can get it and say, oh, this doesn't work. And then you're like, okay, well, send it back to me or I'll just give you a hundred dollar discount. There's like scammers that do things. And so, and then also all the incredible fees that you have to pay. So I actually sold it locally for 850 bucks. The guy knew every, I told him everything about the issue with the controller and all of that. He's going to try to repair it. And that's the thing. Maybe if I was a little bit more patient, a little bit more precise with my hands in terms of like trying to fix something and, you know, um, calm and relaxed to be able to do some fine maneuvering. I could have repaired that controller myself. Might not have been that hard, but I decided to walk away. I decided to walk away from the valve index. I just, you know, I, I'm free as a bird now. I feel free. There's like this giant weight that is off of my shoulders. And, and part of the reason that I walked away, folks, is I believe in a future. I believe in a more exciting future. And I believe in this year, 2021, there is going to be an incredible, amazing VR headset that is going to come out of nowhere to shock the world with a 2880 by 2880 per eye screen. It is going to happen. Yeah, a lot of people are like, well, Anthony, dude, you're free. You got rid of that monkey that was on your back, that Valve Index monkey. You've you've got, you know, you're flush with cash. Reverb G2, bro. Reverb G2. It is time for the Reverb G2. But it's my opinion. I, I know like MRTV might not like this, but it's my opinion that the Reverb G2 is a stop gap measure. It's a stop gap measure. Right now there's a little gap. You can take that Reverb G2 and you can stuff it in there and you can walk right across, all right? But I wanna jump to an entirely new world and I wanna go beyond Reverb G2. A lot of people will say, well, the Reverb G2, it kills screen door dead. Just like Raid kills bugs dead, Reverb G2 kills screen door dead. But I've heard other people say, no, there's a little bit of screen door in the building. You really have to search for it, but it's there. You can find it. Screen door has survived. It is, it is not completely extinct. But I do believe when we get to the era of 2880 by 2880, screen door, bye-bye. So I'm looking for a whole new world there. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, but Anthony, all you got is a crappy ass 1080 Ti and you're talking about 2880 by 2880? Yeah, I know. So maybe I'm a little bit crazy with that. Um, 
you know, maybe I am a little bit crazy, but I'm hopeful for the possibilities of a brand new headset. Um, remember, we have the Consumer Electronics Show that is coming up in the not too distant future. That's gonna be weird, by the way. It's gonna be weird because normally with the Consumer Electronics Show, you know, hey, what time of year it is? It is time for HTC Vive, right? This is the time of the year for HTC Vive to have a ghetto ass press conference, a ghetto ass press conference. We got to admit, like HTC, like like freaking rent a little bit of a higher end ballroom or something, and and like get a few better cameras, like get a camera that's better than like 720p to record your presser, because they need a better presser, right? But. HTC does have some headsets that are waiting in the wings. I don't have a lot of faith. I don't have a lot of faith in HTC, to be completely honest with you, because so far, I mean, you look at the Cosmos. I think I have a Cosmos trailer. Might as well throw it on the screen. Dude, the Cosmos, pretty much a disaster on a stick. The controllers, ginormous you know, just absolutely ginormous controller rings, big, huge, ginormous things. The tracking doesn't work very well. That's the problem. We're, we're hoping to go to this like inside out world of tracking. Like from now on, everything's inside out, right? It's all going inside out. The problem with this new future is only one single company has proven that they really know how to do that properly. And that, of course, is Facebook with Quest 2 and Quest 1. They've proven they know how to do inside out. No one else has proven that yet. Windows Mixed Reality, not good enough. Now, if we did have a legitimate, a real, a real Windows Mixed Reality 2.0, because we don't have that. that that's We don't have that. Reverb G2, you guys know. That's not Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. Like actual Microsoft engineers didn't actually say, okay, let's make Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. No, they just added a couple extra cameras on the side and added some extra tracking volume, but it's essentially the same technology. It's essentially the same stack, you know? So not Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. Will we ever get Windows Mixed Reality 2.0. It's, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up. Will we ever get Windows Mixed Reality 2.0? Because don't you guys remember, let me see if I can find this. Hold on a second. Um, there was a trade show. I think it was in Germany. Was it in Germany? Let me see if I can find this for you. Hold on one second. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me go ahead and cut and paste this into this folder so I have it. And let me sh let me bring this on the screen real quick. Okay, uh, yeah, it's been a minute. Sorry guys, I have not done this for a New York minute. Um, I don't know when my last show was, but here we go, let's see, here we go. Yeah, so this was something that was seen, ladies and gentlemen, at some kind of trade show. And um, this is a Samsung screen. You can see it right there. And then there's like, this is a, another advanced screen that was shown. It was like, yeah, that's JDI, which is Japanese display interface. This one is the Samsung one, which was high resolution. I believe it's like a 20, yeah, it's 2160 by 2160 per eye. Whatever happened to that Samsung screen? You know, whatever happened to this particular JDI screen, the, the, this footage that I'm showing you right here, this is from like years ago. This is several years ago. So it is now going to be the year 2021. And I do believe, see, that's 1001 PPI, you know, so we want to up the PPI which I believe PPI, what that, what's that, uh, pixels per inch? I think pixels per degree is the one that we really give a rat's ass about. But yeah, Samsung, where is Samsung? It's been a minute since, you know, Samsung has been in the game. Obviously, they had the Samsung Odyssey. They had the Odyssey Plus. And of all the companies that are out there that you might think could come into the game and, and, and maybe 
be a disruptive force, I think it would be Samsung of all the technology companies. See, one of the conundrums that we have in PC VR world right now is where's the incentive? Where's the incentive for any company to come out with some kind of like high-end PC VR headset? There's just not a lot of incentive to do this. Because if you don't have your own store, you're not going to make a lot of money on the hardware. The problem is you're competing against something like the Oculus Quest 2, $299. Somebody can go buy one of those and they can use a link cable or they can use virtual desktop. If they've got the right kind of router, they're playing their PC VR games and you know they paid hardly anything for the headset. So where's the incentive for Samsung and Google and all these different companies to try to come in to the PC VR market and try to compete in that market when they don't have their own private store? They don't have their own ecosystem. They don't have their own private Disneyland where they can sell you a Coke for $11 and they can sell you a hot dog for $9.75. They don't have that. And therefore, they lack the incentive. And Samsung, it would be awesome if they had their own kind of... See, the problem with Samsung too, Samsung is like tied at the hip with Microsoft. If you do a couple Google searches on Samsung's relationship with Microsoft, you'll realize that these companies are linked very closely all right so that's a problem for us in vr world the reason why that's a problem because if they weren't linked closely together then samsung could be like you know we're coming out with our own vr headset we're going to make our own freaking thing we don't need windows mixed reality we're going to do our own deal we're going to have our own store and everything but because they're tied to windows it makes it a little bit more complicated. So anyway, I'm talking about new VR headsets. That's what I'm excited for. Right now at this point in time, what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to use an Oculus Quest 2 with Link or Virtual Desktop. I'm gonna be screwing around with both of them and I'm gonna try to use that as my daily driver. I'm going to try. I also have an Oculus, um, no, I have a uh, Oculus Rift. You know, the good old CV1 still have that thing. So I still will be breaking that thing out of retirement. And the nice thing about the Oculus CV1, it works really good with Viport, very good compatibility with like Viport games and stuff. But I really do, dude, I've got four USB sensors on this ceiling and they need to go. They really need to go. I've got two different pairs of Oculus Rift CV1 controllers. I got a backup pair. And they were the greatest controller out there. There's no question about it. The greatest controller out there. But uh, but yeah, I guess we're moving on to this questicle world. And I'm going to try to live with Link. Oh, by the way, I actually... Um, did I tweet this out? I think I tweeted this question out. I'm in the market, folks, for a USB-C to USB-C. So USB-C, the little thing on both ends of the cable. One of them has a 90 degree right angle, you know, to plug into the Quest. And then and then they're, they're both USB-C and 16 feet, 16 feet, okay, five meters. I need a cable. It's gotta be 16 feet, but it's gotta work at legitimate 3.0, uh, USB 3.0, because the thing is, I was on Amazon looking at all these different cables, and then I started reading the reviews, and people are like, oh, this does, it's advertised as 3.0, but it doesn't connect at 3.0, it connects at 2.0. So I'm scared to or order a cable right now. Now I know the Ankler 10 foot cable works great, but that's not long enough. I'll, I'll freaking yank that shit out of the thing immediately. So that's a problem. Um, so anyway, if anybody has a recommendation on that, definitely would appreciate it. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to get into, folks, is I wanted to ask you guys a question. So I believe I have a pretty good feeling what the five best PC VR games of 2020 are. The question is, what is the sixth best? Okay, what is number six? Okay, but first let's talk about the top five. 
Okay, so in my opinion, these are the five best PC VR games of 2020. And I think in tier one, it is Half-Life Alex, and it is The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners. And that's it. They are in their own private tier, and it is not even close, in my opinion. These two games are in their own world. None of these, none of these other games are anywhere near them. And Half-Life Alex is kind of even in its own world ahead of Saints and Sinners. But I feel like those are the two bangers for this year. Those are the clear-cut bangers. Half-Life Alex, I've got a ton of complaints that I've leveled on Half-Life Alex. I feel like the environmental, the environmental storytelling is weak sauce. I've said that because I don't get the feeling that I'm in this freaking City 17 with like George Orwell and shit. I, I just, you know, I mean, there's some really good aspects of Half-Life Alex. It's, it's the best VR game out there. It's ultimately the best VR game we have, period. But I still have lots of complaints and that's just because of how much my expectations are. But it's number one. It's not even, it's not even a question. It's not even a question with all of its faults. It wipes the floor with everything. That one hotel level wipes the, that individual level wipes the floor with everything. Saints and Sinners number two. Okay, then we go to tier two. Now you can put these three games into any particular order that you want. Population one, Medal of Honor. I know this one draws a lot of questions from people out there as far as Medal of Honor. Some people still fill its ass. And I've gone back and forth so many times on this game. I still don't I like it's. You want to talk about a game with a lot of problems? Medal of Honor definitely has a lot of problems, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That was the problem with the early response to that game. And then Star Wars Squadrons. Pretty freaking incredible when you super sample that puppy. So these are the five best PC VR games of 2020. I feel like. These are the five best. The problem is when I was trying to figure out, okay, what's number six? This is where I'm having some struggles. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you guys and, and see, do you guys know like which one is number six? Now you guys might have some complaints and you might say, well, dude, you, you're already wrong. You've already, you've already got it wrong, bro. Cause tower tag belongs <laughs> or whatever, you know? So, okay, who's the six best? So I've come up with a handful here. And there's plenty more that we can also throw into the mix, but some to consider, Phantom Covert Ops, Grip VR, The Room VR, A Dark Matter, Phasmophobia, Solaris Off-Road, and we're, this is PC VR, by the way, folks. So I know some of these games might be on Quest, but we're talking about the PC VR version. Solaris Off-World Combat, Lies Beneath, Overrated, Paper Beast, underrated. The Wizards Dark Times, Blast On, Pixel Ripped, 1990 Fizzle, and Tower Tag. Now, those are a few. I, I typed those out. I had this, I was working on this earlier. I was looking at this. Let's see. Um, some other ones I can, some other ones I can mention is like Mini Motor Racing X, The Persistence, Iron Lights, Grapple Tournament, Walkabout Mini Golf. You know, this Walkabout Mini Golf? God damn, people love that friggin' game, especially on the Oculus Quest. I mean, people are just over the moon about Walkabout Mini Golf. But yeah, the question is what's number six? Gamer Tag VR, Boneworks. Well, dude, Boneworks was last year. Like, the, dude, I'm talking about this year, guys, this year. Boneworks was last year. So, you know, that's the other funny thing that I've seen in on like Twitter and different things. People are all doing best game of the year, man. Best game of 2020. And all kinds of games were not 2020. And, and a lot of them were like December of last year. And it's like, no, sorry, that was December 2019. I know you want to sneak it into 2020, but no, that was not 2020. Yeah, so... um Oh, Tower Tag was not 2020? You lost me at mini golf. No, dude, I'm telling you, walkabout mini golf? People are all about walkabout mini golf. Reckoner VR says, I'm not a Boneworks fan. 
The inverse kinematics is, is interesting, but silly. But dude, the one thing I'll tell you, Reckoner VR and Boneworks talk about like there's a game that, you know, deserves revisiting. I've got so many games that I would love to just like the number one superhero power that I want is to be able to just freeze time, just stop time and just spend like four months playing freaking VR games that I didn't get a chance to play very much and then freaking restart time and continue where I left off. That would be my number one superpower. I've mentioned it a number of times. But here's the thing about Boneworks, man, this world, just to, just to talk about this real quick because a lot of people in chat were mentioning Boneworks, which is 2019. But dude, this world, you feel like you're in this world. Why do you feel like you're in this world? Because everything you touch has weight, has physicality. You know, you can use your elbow to like open something like you can push the door and it pushes a little bit and then it comes back and then you push it and it pushes a little bit. It's like things act. Th OK, look, I know your arms are like like this and it's kind of weird looking at your arms like that. But other than that, man, Boneworks like bo there's a reality in Boneworks. I feel like I'm in there, man. I'm telling you, Boneworks. I mean, it's, it's rough around the edges. There's no question about it. And it is kind of one of these love or hate it type games. And it, it can be very frustrating. Like, like I'm sure I'm like wherever I was, I was stuck in it and I ended up giving up on it. But yeah, that's, that's neither here nor there folks, because that is not 2019. I mean, that is not 2020. We are in the year of our Lord 2020. And what I was asking folks is what is the sixth best what is the sixth best PC VR game? Um, and then the other question is, uh, so I was checking chat. Yeah, Gamer Gamertag VR says, Boneworks is a real stunner, an experiment for VR. Everyone should experience, and the soundtrack is not mentioned or celebrated nearly enough. Yeah, and there's kind of like this atmosphere, like, it's the vibe of just like you feel like you're in like when you push this the when you push the um the fence you know the the fence that's like a chain link fence and it like opens up and it makes the noise and it swings back it's like reality man that's what we're missing in VR like these worlds don't feel real one thing like one of the games that I'm going to be talking about here in just a second is Jurassic World Aftermath. And one of the complaints I have about Jurassic World Aftermath, like one of the biggest complaints I have on that game period is that your hands just go through everything. And that and and also the amount of things that you can touch and pick up and interact is so incredibly limited. And I do want us to get to a world a post boneworks like there's eventually going to be this world where every game has at least the level of interactivity and the level of realness that Boneworks has. And they're going to be beyond that. There's going to be a future, man, where and, and Half-Life Alex, like Boneworks is better than Half-Life Alex when it comes to a real physical like a real world the thing about half-life alex a lot of people will celebrate half-life alex in terms of like the things that you can pick up and a lot of the things that you can do but the thing is they're cheating because they're making physics for very specific things it's not for the whole world it's not like a universal world physics that's what boneworks is using but yeah we got sidetracked there um let's see here yeah, so why don't we get into Jurassic Park Aftermath, because that is something I definitely wanted to talk about today. Um, it's definitely one of the games I've been playing recently. In fact, this is, it's got its issues. There's no question about it. Jurassic Park Aftermath has its issues. Um, but ultimately, this is a compelling piece of software. And I find myself, like whenever I'm about to play uh, whenever I'm about to play a VR game, this is the one I'm going to. Like, this is the number one. I'm going into this over Medal of Honor. Like, I haven't finished Medal of Honor. I'm like, I'm like a third of the way through Medal of Honor. I still haven't been in a lot of the different vehicles and stuff. 
and you know Medal of Honor, but this game has captured my attention even though I've got so many different complaints about it. I have a lot of different complaints. Um, like I was saying earlier, number one complaint is your hands just go through everything. And that sucks because you're trying to be immersed in this world. And one of the things I do for extra immersion, this is the easiest way to get extra immersion in any VR world. I, I used to do this so much back in 2016 when I first had VR, is if you want to add 10% more immersion to any VR game that you're playing. You got to have hands in the world, okay? So they got to give you some kind of hands. But if you have hands in the world and you don't even need inverse kinematics or anything like that, just it could be floating hands. If you have floating hands, you get your hands out here and get them in your, your frame of reference so you can see both hands. So if one hand moves out, of your little narrow field of vision and you don't see it anymore, you effed up. You got to keep both hands up in here. And so like you're walking through the rooms like this. I know it's kind of crazy, right? But it adds extra immersion. It really does because what's going on is your brain is communicating with your hands and your brain is like, wow, these cartoon Jurassic Park looking hands seem to be moving Whenever I'm trying to move, there's like a connection here, man. There's something going on here. And I'm telling you, when you have those hands in your vision, it will give you a little bit more immersion. But here's the thing. When you put those hands through like through the closet or through the little locker or whatever, and they just go right through and they're going through tables and they're going through switches and they're going through coffee cups and everything. We've got to get past this. And this is Jurassic well, I was going to say it's Jurassic Park. It's Jurassic World, okay? And I'm not really a fan. I Like, I think the Jurassic World movies are mostly awful. Um, I'm a fan that Jurassic Park is, like, back. But, um, but I'm a Jurassic Park, like, original guy. Like, Jurassic Park 1, you know, Jurassic Park 3, kind of decent. Jurassic Park 2, cringe as F cringe as f but kind of good cringe and a kind of like worth watching cringe um but this is jurassic world dude like do you hear a lot of the jurassic world music so i'm assuming they have the actual license to jurassic world because it's jurassic world aftermath and every once in a blue moon i will hear a little bit of jurassic world sound like no, no, no. You know, you'll hear just a little bit of it, but it's like, bro, you've got the Jurassic World license. Like, you need to take full and total advantage. When you're just in the menu screen, like Coat Sync, look, you guys are great developers. You guys are very talented developers. Shadow Point, incredible. One of my favorite quest games, bar none. A great PC VR game as well. Coat Sync, very talented. You know, they helped out Downpour Interactive, bringing Onward to the quest. Um, so they've done some incredible things, right? And, and very good developer. I just have a feeling that this game was probably made in a relatively short period of time because, dude, Jurassic World, they could have took much greater advantage of the license. And like when you're in the menus and you're just doing like continue or new game, it is the most generic like menu screen. Like it could be na, 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 na. And, and like just a beautiful high resolution like backdrop where you just see like a a big ass brachiosaurus like in the background like real high resolution photo with like new game continue and the music just the music man the music where is it maybe i haven't played it long enough and i haven't gotten far enough in it to get to that part but i do continue to play this it is it is my number one banger i mean i look it's not the greatest game in the world it gets um it gets really annoying after a while. Like I basically have, I'm kind of stuck in it right now. I just keep dying over and over again. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find, I know I grabbed like somebody's gameplay video of uh, Jurassic World. Okay, here we go. I'll just throw this on the background. This is somebody's gameplay video. 
And yeah, I so what about the art style? What about the cell shaded? I love the cell shaded look, not for the dinosaurs. It actually works against the dinosaurs. It works against the fear factor. But you know what I like it for is just kind of like walking around and just being in this world. The way the li like the lights, the the sunlight that's coming through those windows and stuff. You'll be in certain areas and you know the lights are glowing and it has a certain hue to it and it kind of reminds me of Compound. And it has kind of, you know, this retro -y vibe. You know what this actually makes me think of, honestly, is I think of Jurassic Park on the Sega CD. This is like, this is like what we dreamed an incredible Sega VR headset working with the Sega CD in tandem and Jurassic Park on Sega CD. This is what we'd be playing, you know, in like a fever dream that you'd have back in 1994 when you had a Sega CD. And you had Jurassic Park CD. Does anybody remember Jurassic Park from Sega CD? Because this is like the ultimate dream of that. And so being in this cartoony world, I thought it was, I, I think it looks really nice. The thing is like the raptors and the dinosaurs, the fear factor is removed dramatically because of, you know, the cartoony aspect. So, and, and that might have been intentional. You know, they might have started development of this game and had everything being realistic and they might have found out, you know what, this is just too damn scary for like just average Joe Blow people. See, the thing is, we're VR nut jobs and these games are not designed for VR nut jobs. That's the problem. And we can play this scary stuff. There's people that nope out of Half-Life Alex, They can't do Half-Life Alex. Like there's people that can't do horror at all. And so making this cartoonish might allow so many more people to do it. Might, might allow so many more people to enjoy this game where they would nope out otherwise. Um, so let's see, one of the other things I wanted to mention though, sound design, sound design in this game. Like the Raptors are not scary. They're not scary, but the sound, the sound is good. Like all the sound and the animations and the things that the rap Raptors do, the little noises that they make and stuff, that is really cool. I think some of what they did with um, like adjusting certain knobs and stuff so you can get past uh, little puzzles and, you know, the little puzzles. Now, here's one thing that does suck, though, is that hardly anything is interactive. You know, you go around all kinds of stuff and there's hardly anything you can pick up and touch. There's a few, there's a handful of things and the things that you can touch is like colored or blinking and it's pretty obvious. And so we've eventually got to get past this. What I want to see at some point in time, so Oculus, okay, Oculus, you've decided that the Oculus is the future of the funk. The, it's all about Oculus, right? Okay, well, let's see a $50 million Oculus Quest game. If it's all about Oculus, I mean, if, if it's all about the Oculus Quest, okay, let's see it, man. Put $50 million down. What if they gave $25 million? You know, like, like what if they, you know, spent a lot of time and a lot of effort making a really, really kick-ass Jurassic Park on the quest that is like super detailed, it's expansive, lots of interactivity everywhere, lots of things to pick up and touch, your hands aren't going through things, maybe some inverse kinematics as well. Um, but I still like this. I, I'm still having a lot of fun with this. Like when I'm done with this show, Later tonight, I will be playing this. This is my go-to, you know? Later tonight, I will be playing this, and then right after that, rack it in X, baby, for another 20-minute burst. But yeah, and so, oh, another thing I wanted to talk about real quick, and so this will basically be about pretty much the last thing that I will talk about for the day. Um, but let's see here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is, let me see if I can find this other trailer. Um, uh, <clears throat> so one thing I've been doing folks is I'm bouncing back and forth between two Oculus quests. Um, the last time I, I did one of these shows, or maybe it was on MRTV. Um, I mentioned that I tried to buy Jurassic Park Aftermath and I couldn't because I'm locked 
because one of my Oculus, I have two Oculus Quest accounts. That's my problem. So you're not supposed to have two Oculus Quest accounts. Um, hold on, I want to try to find a different trailer. Um, and then my third banger, my third banger is this one. Shooty Skies Overdrive. Still having fun in this game. This Dude, this game... You want to like have an acid trip without taking acid? You want an ayahuasca trip without doing ayahuasca? Here you go, babe. Shooty Skies Overdrive will put you in a kind of weird... And I could only imagine somebody that actually would use some crazy psychedelic and play this at the same time. Because it definitely... I can be stone cold sober and this game will make me feel a little bit psychedelic. But yeah, so I, I bounce in Jurassic World Aftermath, then get a little bit of Racket in X action, then jump into Shooty Skies Overdrive. Yeah, it's like quick bang, bang. All of these games, it's like a 25-minute burst, 25-minute burst, 25-minute burst. Yeah, I'm kind of doing these like quick action, quick banger type gameplay sessions. You don't see me playing no three-hour VR game. That ain't my style. But I'm bouncing back and forth between these two headsets. And the reason is it's the Oculus, you know, it's the Facebook thing, right? So I've got one personal Facebook account. And what happened was this one personal Facebook account was actually connected to both of my Oculus accounts, but it was only really working properly in one of them. And so the account that I wanted to buy Jurassic World Aftermath for, my own private VR game rankings account, that's where I wanted to buy it. I couldn't even get into the store because it was like it was having this problem because of the whole. So anyway, I contacted somebody from Oculus, uh, just their regular customer service, not some inside YouTuber help. And they unlinked uh, my Facebook account to the account that didn't need it. And they just kept it on that one account. And so now my other account has been returned to normalcy. The problem is it's stuck on my Quest 1. So I have a Quest 1 and I have a Quest 2. And so my Quest 1 has one account on it and my Quest 2 has an account on it. And I'm just bouncing back and forth because it's like, oh, this game is on Quest 2. This game's on Quest 1. Like Racket NX is on my Quest 2. Looks really freaking sharp and smooth and shit. And then Jurassic World Aftermath and uh, Shooty Skies Overdrive is on my Quest 1. But the thing is, when I put on that Quest 1 and I turn it on for the first time, I got to tell you that the black background with the white Oculus logo, it is so much more black. There are certain aspects of the OLED screen on the Quest 1 that people, people underrate the Quest 1 to this day. Like all you people that panic sold your Quest 1, you made a hell of a mistake. Like, you know, you know, you know, you done effed up, right? You know, you done effed up because you could have sold your Quest 1. Like, if you really wanted to take advantage of the situation, you would have been selling your Quest 1 like a week ago. You would have got a lot of money for it, even though it's a Quest 1. It still would have gotten good money because people can't find these things anywhere and they need to put it under the tree. So those of you that sold your panic, you know, you panic sold your Quest 1 in the very beginning. You kind of got boned. I mean, I know you got some money for it and all that, but you could have had way more money for it. The other thing is, you probably shouldn't have sold it because it's still a damn good headset. And in some ways, see, for me with my 70 IPD on my Quest 1, it's perfectly set. I can enjoy the Quest 2, but it's a little bit blurry. It's a little bit off. It's not ideal. It's definitely not ideal. Now, I'm able to overlook a lot of that because of the high resolution and everything else it's enough of a bonus where i'm like i'm good with this it's working good but when i go back to the quest one it's like oh it's eye relief tremendous eye relief but here's the downside folks so my quest two the franken mod is on the quest two the franken mod was on the quest one took it back converted my quest one back to stock no Franken mod. I'm tempted to buy another deluxe audio strap. I think that's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to get another deluxe audio strap because I'm bouncing back and forth. And so in 2023 or whatever, 
I am going to have to get a Facebook account. And I'm trying to find somebody with a Facebook account. I might have to make like a Facebook account for a family member that never uses Facebook and be like, hey, I'm just going to make a Facebook account. You're never going to use it, but you know, is it good? Are we all good with that? It's so unbelievable that Oculus does not have some kind of strategy for people that are part, they're part of like organizations and they have like multiple Oculus accounts. Like what does Upload VR do? What does Road to VR do? do? Do they each have like, do they have like five Oculus Quests there that are all tied to like people there, their individual face? Like it's kind of stupid. Like maybe, okay, maybe Upload VR or Road to VR, like maybe there's the Cool Kids Club. And maybe if you're in the Cool Kids Club, you can get like a special Facebook, like it's almost like a dummy Facebook account just to get by the bull crap so that an organization can use it. Like they need to figure something out there for damn show. Alrighty, folks. Well, you know what? I pretty much have covered the stuff that I did want to cover. I am glad to be back into the mix and doing something again because it's been a minute. Um, so I'm glad to... Um, get back on here and put some content on this channel because I know it's been a while. It's been a drought season for VR365. I am working on VR game rankings. Like I have been banging away on VR game rankings um, in my spare time, but I've been working a lot of hours. I'm working a lot of hours and then I do this workout routine and it's just when you when you work that many hours then you come home and you do this like workout routine and then it's like man there's hardly any hours left I need a cup I need like at least 1 hour of just some little VR entertainment I got to hop on the internet check some stuff out on Discord and Reddit some different things and then it's like bedtime man and it's all over with so I just haven't had the time very much but I do want to definitely thank any, any any of the Patreon supporters that have stuck with me through all of this, not a lot of you left, but those that are there, absolutely appreciate it. Thanks so much. I turned it off for January, but I'm still going to be doing, I'll be doing some episodes in January, no question about it. And this episode's pretty much done, but um, <clears throat> this Saturday, noon Pacific, I will be on the Next Dimension podcast on MRTV's channel. And we're going to be talking about, we're basically going to be looking back at the year 2020, the biggest stories in VR of the year. I believe that's what we're going to do. <laughs> Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something completely there, completely different. But tune in on Saturday at noon Pacific on MRTV's channel and find out all about it. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for this particular episode. And I will see you guys next time. Everybody have a good one. Take it easy and later.